Hello, welcome everyone to Brain Matters number 10 special episode on Alzheimer's with the topic how the human brain project enables clinical research for dementia. This webinar series is organized by the Human Brain Project and the main goal is to show you, the audience, the work of the researchers of the HBP uh, community and in particular to showcase the scientific breakthroughs but also to demonstrate the new technologies that are being developed by the HBP community and that are part of the new eBrains infrastructure of the Human Brain Project. Um, the webinar also provides a platform for the experts of the HPP community and today I'm very happy to introduce three experts from the Charité Berlin, Dr. Leon Stefanowski, Dr. Jill Mona Meyer and Dr. Michael Schirner. They all three will present in each 10 minutes their research on the topic. And afterwards, uh, we also will have a question and answer session. So you have the opportunity, if you have question, please post them in the question and answer uh, section uh, that is provided by Zoom. And also please add the speaker to whom you would like to address uh, this question. And please also note that we are not answering questions that are um, uh, posted in the chat window. So please use the question and answer a section for your questions. My name is Petra Ritter. I am also a researcher at the Charité in Berlin and I will act as the moderator today. Um, at the beginning, I will give you a short introduction to the topic, how the Human Brain Project enables clinical research for dementia, as we all know, the brain is a very complex organ and as complex as the brain is, uh, are also the processes that contribute to dementia and in particular to Alzheimer's disease. And the methods that we have to study the brain usually only capture a subsection of these temporal and spatial scales. So one of the big goals of the Human Brain Project is to enable to bring together the many different uh, snippets of uh, observations and to integrate them in a comprehensive theoretical framework to understand the principles uh, of brain function and also of dysfunction. Another challenge that we see is that uh, the brains are very variable. So they differ between different persons. Here you see an example of a brain of my colleague, uh, Jessica Palmer, um, but uh, the brains are different and as different as they are between healthy people, as different are also the processes that contribute to the development of dementia and uh, of Alzheimer's disease. So we have to take into account the inter-individual differences and understand their consequences. And also this problem is uh, tackled in the Human Brain Project. Um, the goal is to not only integrate the many different data modalities and data types to capture the complexity of the human brain, but also to integrate the individual measurements, the individual data of individual persons and patients. And here you see such an example of a digital twin and the different modalities and derivatives of the different measurements are integrated in a, a brain model of a person. Um, to achieve this and to enable building uh, digital twins of human brains, we need uh, many processing steps and many tools, different kinds of software, eBrains, um, provides the opportunity to easily find the software and uh, the research community and the Human Brain Project also develops uh, special types of software that is fully automated, that also takes advantage of uh, latest technologies. So it can be run on a personal notebook, but also, for example, on supercomputers. And these automated workflows are fully reproducible and enable a processing of large cohort data sets to uh, capture the inter-individual 
differences that we need in order to develop uh, clinical uh, applications. Here you see now a real simulation of a human brain. And when we simulate a brain, we reproduce uh, in principle the activity that we can also measure. So here we reproduce the activity of a 22 minutes uh, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging measurement. Um, but at the same time, we also generate the underlying um, processes like uh, the neuronal firing rates. So here at the bottom, you see the firing rates of excitatory and inhibitory neurons in the occipital region. And uh, by being able to generate these underlying uh, processes that we usually cannot measure, we can find new mechanisms underlying brain function, but also uh, dysfunction as we see it in dementia. So the eBrains platform um, has some core components. And you see here in the middle column, some core services listed. It's very important, of course, as a core infrastructure, the high performance computing centers, but we also have a cloud infrastructure that provides the workspaces where researchers can work together collaboratively. And another very important component is the so-called knowledge graph that allows to not only discover data and data sets on the platform, but also tools, software, and services. And another feature of the eBrains platform and its core building blocks is that eBrains is also developing standards and um, also um, employing the standards to their own uh, infrastructure. And this enables uh, software developers and researchers uh, that generate, for example, data to use the same standards for their tools and services and for their data to make them interoperable with the core infrastructure, but also amongst the, the different services. So for example, a brain simulator or processing pipeline can be coupled with the digital atlases that are deployed in the eBrains infrastructure. And with this, the different uh, services and data can be integrated and interfaced, which makes them much more powerful tools for brain research. In the recent years, we had uh, several um, very important uh, innovations in the field of uh, brain simulation. Um, one is the multi-scale co-simulation, where it is possible now to simulate the brain at different uh, scales of resolution uh, simultaneously. Um, then we have uh, digital drug testing, we have in silico deep brain or brain stimulation. We have now the possibility to systematically integrate biological knowledge bases to brain models uh, to make the brain models more biologically plausible. Um, also, a recent development is to couple these virtual brains with virtual bodies um, or simulators of the body to see the effect, uh, the dynamics that a simulated has on the output organs. Uh, and uh, last but not least, very important, in fact, is the possibility to really simulate human cognitive function. And in the following presentations uh, by our three experts, we will see different flavors of these innovations and how they are being employed and further developed um, to tackle the challenge of dementia. And with this, I am very happy to hand over to the first speaker, Dr. Leon Stefanowski. He will be presenting on how brain simulations help to um, improve classification of Alzheimer's disease and in silico drug testing. It's your floor, Dr. Leon Stefanowski. Thank you very much. So um, as you mentioned, I will uh, speak about uh, how to use um, brain simulation to improve diagnostics and also um, treatments of Alzheimer's dementia. And therefore, I want to uh, shortly uh, recap what we've already heard in the first part of this webinar about how virt the virtual brain works. So actually, um, it's a simulation platform that is mainly based on the structural connectivity, as you can see here on the right side based on uh, diffusion tensor imaging from individual MRIs. So you can build individual virtual brain models, and then you can calculate the 
uh, raw neural activity based on mathematical models of neural behavior. And this is then the raw neural activity that can be projected into many different modalities as for example, EEG or fMRI or whatever. And, and that far you can connect it to also functional empirical data. And um, as mentioned before, you can do it on a local machine, but you can also do it on a cloud uh, service as it is also possible to use it directly on eBrains. And I'm particularly interested, especially also as I'm partly working also as a clinician and, and also as a researcher in the treatment of neurodegenerative diseases. And there are three columns how we can use the virtual brain here. First is to really improve diagnostic, uh, in this case with a machine learning approach, which I will show you later. But we can also improve virtual, virtual therapies by drug testings or virtual invasive treatments. And the more complicated stuff, but also one of the most interesting is to explore mechanisms. For example, here you see a mechanism in healthy controls of uh, by stability, switching behavior between these two modes. And just with, with mathematical means, you can uh, uh, analyze how these behaviors um, are uh, made actually. And this is something you can't do in uh, the real world. You can only do it if you reproduce the behavior, you can look into the equations. But I will be, uh, focus on Alzheimer's disease, which uh, I worked on for several years now. And in one work, we made use of amyloid PET data uh, from the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative. So we had uh, for uh, several Alzheimer's disease patients and, and controls individual amyloid PET imaging, and we know the burden of amyloid in each area of the brain. And we translated this to a mechanistic model of the disease. So basically, we uh, took one particular mechanism, which is the impairment of inhibitory interneurons by amyloid beta um, that afterwards leads to hyperexcitation. And we combined this with a generic, so a healthy structural connectome because we wanted to explore the sole effect of this um, amyloid beta. Just um, imagine we infect a healthy brain in silico with Alzheimer's disease. And what uh, we, we made then is that we just impaired this connection in this Janssen rip model is one neural mass model in each region of the brain and we have pyramidal cells and excitatory and inhibitory interneurons and with more are better the connection from the inhibitory interneurons to the pyramidal cells was reduced and what we have seen then is that it appeared what we expected that the Alzheimer's disease patients showed slowing and local field potentials and an EEG and basically a switch from alpha activity to low theta activity, as you can see it here between groups. And this was also what we expected from empirical data. And it was something that we could uh, show to uh, reverse by a virtual treatment. And the idea is here that memantine is an approved drug for the symptomatic treatment of Alzheimer's disease, and it's an NMDA antagonist. So um, it's definitely just from the theory, it would act against this mechanism because it reduces hyperexcitation. And we saw exactly this effect, the slowing in the Alzheimer's disease group that appeared without memantine was reversible by applying virtual memantine. So uh, directly speaking, reducing the NMDA transmission in the model that was already affected by amyloid beta. But we have also used this model to improve the diagnostic classification. So here, as you see, a uh, uh, higher dimensional space of features between three groups, Alzheimer's disease, healthy controls, and mild cognitive impairment. And um, you can see that these clouds of data points show different patterns, of course, but they are not so distinct that you can just distinguish between them with a classic biomarker. Thing. So a traditional biomarker would be just a line uh, cut, uh, defining a cutoff value to say, okay, everything above has Alzheimer or not. But what you can do is to use machine learning for that. And therefore we use the complex machine learning algorithm based on support vector machines and random forest for feature selection. And we compared the performance first just with the empirical data, which was amyloid pads, tau pads, and MRI volumetrics. So all already a multimodal uh, data approach and then only the simulated data, so the artificial local field potentials, and all together. And what we found out is that this um, combined feature space improves the classification rate by about 0.1, which is quite good, and it was significant, and um, it really shows that without introducing more information, just the simulation inside of TVB can improve the classification itself. But how can we now bring this to the next level. So I explained a bit the, the mechanism behind this particular approach, and we uh, have 
chosen one particular aspect of Alzheimer's disease, which is this disinhibition um, based on inhibitory neurons. But in principle, we would like to have a more general approach to uh, extract mechanisms from the knowledge from the literature. And therefore, we can make use of knowledge technologies. And one um, thing there is uh, a knowledge basis. So uh, the Fraunhofer Institute, which uh, one we are collaborating, has built several um, ontologies, also graph-like structures that uh, contain information about the interaction of biological compounds, for example, proteins and genes and how they interact in a particular disease. And one uh, particular uh, ontology here is the neuromm -SIC. It's uh, about Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's disease, and epilepsy. And if you zoom in to this graph, you see that these are these nodes are, for example, these uh, biological compounds, and you see the interaction between them, which are actually the disease pathways. But what we do not know is where in the brain do these pathways take place. And this is, of course, crucial if we want to introduce them into a brain simulation. And for that, we developed a new software that is based on, a, um, on an existing one, also by Fraunhofer. Um, it's called TV Base. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's still unpublished. And it makes use of the um, modern search engine Skyview. And what does Skyview? Skyview is very similar to a uh, search engine PubMed, for example, it also contains the same 32 million scientific articles as PubMed. The, the difference is you can search for something and the papers that you get as results are highly annotated. So they were gone through text mining and therefore you know what, or the, the computer know what the, what the words in these articles mean. It can be genes, for example, uh, or chemical compounds, but it can also be anatomical terms. They will make use of the so-called Uberon ontology, which is an ontology um, containing all semantic concepts that you can use for describe anatomy in general, but also for neuroanatomy. And uh, making use of this, we can extract statistics about how often in a particular search query um, a brain region is mentioned. And the only thing that then was missing is a transformation from these semantic uh, mapping to a uh, three-dimensional mapping. And therefore, we developed in a um, complicated um, anatomical um, annotation process uh, a connection between 1,000 anatomical terms to the three-dimensional template of the brain. And then we make, made use of the uh, parcellation of the human connectome project, so the Glasser parcellation. And with this, we can then just directly map every, every mappable or queryable concept directly onto a brain template. So it looks, for example, like here for the term frontotemporal dementia, and our software can also reparcelate it into more than 40 different parcellations. And this will also be um, available in eBrains then afterwards in the future when it is published. And what we can do then with this is that we can map all these nodes in such a knowledge graph as NeuroMMSIC, and then we know where these processes take place and can directly inject them into a simulation. And this can be together with empirical data from eBrains. So for example, with the Python client Zebra, you can extract um, region-wise data from the eBrains data platform. And for example, you can uh, include receptor densities that were measured on healthy controls or also gene expression rates that can be combined with this semantic information about pathways into a simulation. So eBrains and TV Base provides the maps um, in, a, in a ontology that we are also developing that systematizes the mathematical knowledge. And then we can really knowledge driven, in a knowledge driven way, create mechanistic models as we did it before. And to show you this, I will just come back to the model I've shown in the beginning. So here we used empirical amyloid PET, but we can also reproduce the same results by using the TV base semantic association map of amyloid beta in concept of different diseases. And as you can see here, the slowing only appears in context of Alzheimer's disease. And for other diseases as frontotemporal dementia or vascular dementia or Parkinson's disease, we don't see the slowing effect. So we can reproduce this result even without data, just on a generic disease-based way. So our idea is really to bring all this together and we can use knowledge technology together with brain simulation to explore um, pathways itself. Then we can further investigate them in a simulation and we can also use them to get new ideas for, for knowledge inferred treatments. And in principle, we want to have the whole infrastructure all together. So from pathway analysis to clinical trials all connected with brain simulation and these technologies that we are happy to use. And with that, I, with this, I would end. I just show you my references and I would hand over then again 
to Petra Ritter. Thank you very much, Dr. Stefanowski. Um, questions can be posted to the question and answer section, and we continue directly with the next expert, Dr. Jill Meyer, and she will speak about in silico deep brain stimulation to improve patient outcomes. It's your stage. Thank you very much, Petra. Yes, I will present to you how we can explore virtual treatment options using the virtual brain together in combination with e-brains. Over the last couple of years, I've been diving into the treatment of deep brain stimulation. It's a very important field and it has been an improved treatment um, by the FDA already for a couple of diseases. And here it's also been used in Europe for Parkinson's disease, um, obsessive compulsive disorders and many more. And it's also in the context of today on Alzheimer's disease, it's an investigational treatment in Alzheimer's disease. There have been some patients already implanted with a DBS device, but the, uh, so far the outcomes for Alzheimer's disease are very variable. So we can see some patients improving after DBS treatment and some patients even worsening. So one has to pay very close attention to the side effects of cognitive decline using deep brain stimulation, even though in the kind of uh, in the world of motor diseases, it seems to be very well uh, functioning. All right, let's dive in. So, yes, the vision here would be that we will talk now um, for our recent study about Parkinson's disease. A Parkinson's disease patient would come into the clinic and get all diff different measurements of uh, structural MRI, clinical assessments, and so on. And we would build a virtual brain of this Parkinson's disease patient using also his functional data, for example, fMRI data, to make the virtual brain dynamics as close as possible to the real brain and the empirical data that we have of this particular patient. Then we would use eBrains and other um, high performance cluster services to calculate the E field, the electric field around the electrode, have the exact placement of the electrode and vary this placement and the programming of the electrode um, and optimize with that the treatment in silico. So we'll try out different amplitudes, frequencies, different forms of stimuli, different placements of this electrode to find the best option to move the virtual brain of that patient from a disease state closer towards a healthy functioning. And with that, we would like to use eBrains and the virtual brain to personalize treatment and find the optimal, what Leon has talked about, um, medication, but also the optimal DBS placement and programming for each individual patient. So the research question uh, we set out to answer was, what's the optimal treatment for, in this case, a Parkinson's disease patient in the realm of deep brain stimulation? And can modeling actually assist in finding this optimal solution? We just recently published a paper in experimental neurology about this, where we built a model to answer this question. And we also um, yeah, brought, used the new uh, framework that Petra mentioned of the virtual brain multiscale. Why would we need a multiscale perspective here on deep brain stimulation? It was cl quite clear to us that the area just around surrounding the electrode in the basal ganglia is very important and we have to pay close attention to what's happening there in the, um, in the order of actual single spikes being fired there, spike trains being altered, synchronization happening or being disrupted by DBS. So we decided to model the areas around the electrode, which is mo most often placed in the subthalamic nucleus or globus pallidum internus for Parkinson's disease. And we modeled all of this in a spiking network framework using the software Anarchy. But we connected this framework with the multi-scale software with the rest of the brain. All the other brain regions were modeled with mean field models and um, were showing and giving out average activity of each brain region. So with this multi-scale framework of some regions being modeled in detail and some in a more coarser context, we looked at what's happening and we switched on the simulations. So this is what we could see for a patient's resting state activity. You see our regions are just being activated round and round. Now the electrode is placed inside the subthalamic nucleus and you see a direct reaction, not only of the surrounding areas of the electrode, but also of areas being much further away. And you see this kind of network effect 
of uh, the deep brain stimulation in silico. Of course, from the video, we cannot see it all. So we analyzed the data in a different format and looked first of all into the spiking activity of specifically the thalamus. We were quite happy to see that we could reproduce what was already known from literature, namely that the thalamus activity got disinhibited when we switched on virtually the electrode. You can see the um, effect here for one control and here one Parkinson's disease patient. We can see already the controls activity in the thalamus is much higher than the patient's activity. By switching on the electrode, we kind of were able to normalize the activity getting closer again to healthy functioning for that individual patient. We use different stimuli, as I said, biphasic or monophasic ones. And now the most interesting part of the model was not that we could validate what was known already in spiking network literature around the basal ganglia and deep brain stimulation, but that we could also simultaneously observe what's happening in the rest of the brain, what's happening on the cortex, what's happening in areas further away from the electrode. And for example, we could see when we compare the resting state activity of the patient and the control, that in the post-central gyrus, the control had much more activity. And on the other hand, by switching on virtually the DBS electrode, this activity in the patient was coming up and increasing in the post-central gyrus, seen here by the black and red areas of the different forms of stimuli that we um, virtually tested out. Another point for us was that the frontal regions, we, you can see quite clearly, were activated by the electrode and showing diverse patterns. This was um, already seen in fMRI studies previously published where they switched on the DBS electrode inside an fMRI and could see exactly that, that frontal regions, among them the middle frontal gyrus, have the biggest shift between DBS off to DBS on measurements. The insula was also one of the top regions in our case that were activated by the virtual DBS. And the insula is strongly linked uh, with non-motor symptoms in PD. So we see this model as um, potential to move forward to also explore these side effects and non-motor symptoms. Another thing we could see here was a slight reduction of activity in other areas like the supplementary motor area, which is known to be impaired in PD and Actually, a non-invasive stimulation, TMS, of this region improved freezing of gait symptoms in Parkinson's disease patients. So to conclude, we saw this was in line with literature, what our model did when we switched on virtually the electrode. We constructed this virtual model and produced then realistic firing behavior, not only a resting state, but also after different stimuli. Actually, this link will be posted in the chat and you will find a kind of a guide there to guide you through how to simulate all of this yourself on eBrains, and also all the code is available on GitHub. What were the benefits now of the model that we developed um, with the Human Brain Project for the last years? We can now observe cortical effects simultaneously to the effects surrounding the electrode. And we have now a flexible individual model to test out these different stimuli, observe their, their effects and optimize. And this model compared to spiking only models were, was more realistic in space and time, since now we were driving the spiking network, not from a Poisson train process or anything like that, but from the actual cortical activities of the different regions. Just as an outlook, I wanna shortly show you what we are doing in the future. We started with a larger cohort and we started testing out this model for different patients, including now the precise redelocation of the different electrodes. And we aim uh, to identify symptom specific dynamics. So to actually set out and link the patterns of activation that we can see here, for example, in our newest simulations where DBS is off and now switched on, you see much more colors um, and more intensive colors coming up. We want to link the patterns that we see here for an individual patient to the symptom improvement profile of such an individual patient. And now I wanna close with um, showing you some references and also pointing you towards um, our YouTube channel and the eBrains TVB Nest app, where you can use the TVB multi-scale environment directly and run an updated version of our model on eBrains. So no need to install anything. And you find uh, lots of notebooks on eBrains CoLab, where we show also simpler versions of brain stimulation, how you can proceed with that.
on your own. Thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to the question. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jill Meyer. Um, questions, uh, please post them again in the Q&A section. We will discuss them at the end of the webinar. And now we come to our final expert speaker, Dr. Michael Schirner, and he will talk about multi-scale brain network modeling to infer principles of cognitive brain function. It's your floor. Thank you, Dr. Ritter. The title of this talk is Multiscale Brain Network Modeling to Infer Principles of Cognitive Brain Function. You will notice that in this talk, I don't use the word Alzheimer, um, as this would be a prerequisite to then later study Alzheimer with brain network models. So we are here implementing cognition into brain network models in order to later study how impaired cognition would look like. And we are focusing here on decision making and different speeds of decision making. So there are decisions that we can make really quickly and easily. Um, like interpreting a traffic light, but there are also decisions that require us hard thinking and it this takes time, like finding the best route on such a subway map. And the question, what underlies differences in intelligence? So why some people make more errors on intelligence tests than others is a question that bothers science since uh, more than 130 years when the first standardized intelligence tests were created. And one of the prime theories for explaining intelligence is that smart people may be smart because they have faster brains. And this is really a well-supported finding over 172 studies is over 50,000 participants where you have really a strong and persistent, robust relationship between processing speed and general intelligence. And so these processing speed tests are really very simple and it's really surprising that they give so much information about individuals. It's really just um, answering a question like, press a button when the color green appears. And it's really surprising that these processing speed tests are now so tightly correlated with much more complex, um, uh, higher level reasoning abilities or spatial visualization, memory and speed. Um, so as we can see here, this tight correlation even persists over lifetime with the only exception being vocabulary, which tends to increase over age. Reaction time for simple tasks is even a better predictor of death than physical activity, blood pressure, alcohol, or body mass index, the leading predictor right after smoking. And it also explains the widely reported relationship between intelligence and death. And this is really surprising. Um, because, as mentioned, the processing speed tests are very easy. The tests for measuring um, higher cognitive function like fluid intelligence are typically much harder, but they also uh, lie on a spectrum like there's a continuum um, from easy to hard. So as you can see on the left side, the rule that governs this figure that governs this figure can be relatively easily identified, right? We just need to tilt the figure to the right and this will give us the correct answer. But on the right side, we can see that this test can also be very hard. So here, at least for me, it's not so easy to find the rule that governs this figure and find the correct solution. And what we found um, challenges this longstanding finding that um, higher intelligence results from a faster brain because we actually found that participants with higher intelligence were only quicker when responding to simple problems, but they actually needed more time to correctly solve complex problems. And this became apparent in PMAT, which consists of 24 of these questions that I just showed with increasing uh, that get increasingly harder. So while processing speed tests are typically so simple that you hardly make any errors, these tests can be so hard that you cannot solve them even if you have um, uh, um, sufficient time or uh, no time limit. And there it becomes really visually apparent. So for a very easy question, we see that the people with a higher um, general intelligence were quicker to make the, to find the correct solution. But um, when the tests get harder, we find that the people with higher intelligence actually needed more time to find the correct solution. We can really see how there is a flip in the correlation around question nine, um, where suddenly the higher intelligent people need more time. And this is another 
incarnation, so to say, of a theory that was that was born out of the field of economics, and for which Daniel Kahneman received the Nobel Prize in economics also. And he um, um, infers that there is a system, uh, two mind systems in the brain, um, with two different speeds at which thinking, hap thinking happens. So we have this fast system with little or no effort and no sense of volatility control, and we have a slow system, which is often associated with subjective experience of agency and choice. And mistakes occur according to Kahneman if we allow our system one to process a cognitive decision why we should really have passed it on to this slower system. Um, and now we try to explain this in terms of, um, of, 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 neuro, of neural infrastructure, of brain network activity and brain network mechanisms. So we first looked at, at functional connectivity, the strengths of functional brain network activity, as we can infer it with fMRI. And we see here um, high correlations on a single subject level, completely independent of the complexity or of the intelligence. We just find that slower solvers have a higher resting state activity. Their brains are more synchronous. And now we try to model this with brain network models. And one new step that we are going with these models is that we add feed forward inhibition. So previously, brain network models simulated the brain only as a network that had long range excitation. So there were only um, connections between the excitatory populations on the long range. But now we add feed forward inhibition. So uh, um, an axon touches the inhibitory populations and this inhibits the local partner. So here we have on the left side uh, a high ratio, a high excitation inhibition ratio. There's a lot of excitation and not so much inhibition and vice versa on the, on the right side. And what we found is that by tuning the excitation inhibition ratio, we can precisely set the functional connectivity between two brain areas. And by extending this logic now to every pair of brain areas, we can precisely fit the entire um, simulated FC to an empirical FC with a really high fit and a high correlation. And we did this for 650 subjects of the human connectome pro project for, from which we also had these intelligence tests and um, brain network activity. And we fitted them all with a very high fit to the empirical data. And then looked inside the model what signatures of intelligence we could find there. And indeed, we found that the slower people had a higher synchrony of the underlying input currents, the synaptic input currents, but the amplitude of these currents were lower. And when we then tested again this relationship against excitation inhibition balance, we found that um, indeed excitation inhibition inhibition balance modulates the synchrony of brain network activity, the brain synchrony and the amplitude. So with a higher excitation inhibition balance, the amplitude goes down and the synchrony goes up. Now we're making a, a shift. So what we talked about now were large scale brain networks on a level of brain regions. But now we are talking about small scale um, populations. And in the brain, there are populations for decision making and working memory. And the mechanism which explains decision making is called winner take all competition. So populations get sensory input and they integrate the sensory input over time um, until a certain um, threshold is hit. And uh, when this threshold is hit, this population assumes a high activity state. The higher the activity of decision option A here, um, the more get, gets the other option inhibited. And this leads to this winner-take-all competition. Now, what we learned on the large scale, we now implemented on this small scale model. Specifically, we tested out the amplitude, the synaptic input, uh, input amplitude, and the synchrony of amplitudes. And we found, indeed, that decreasing the amplitude increased the percentage of correct decisions and the integration time. Likewise, increasing the synchrony of the brain activity increased the percentage of correct decisions and the integration time. So here we go full circle. In the empirical data, we found that slower people made better decisions then slow, slowness was also associated with a higher FC. In our model, we then found that higher FC is associated with decreased amplitude and increased synchrony of synaptic inputs. In the small scale model, we then again found that a decreased amplitude and increased synchrony leads to slower and better solutions. And um, what we did now is we coupled this um, small scale circuit 
with the large scale to form a multi-scale model. So to connect this winner take all mechanism with the large scale brain network activity. And indeed, we find that the brain models of smarter subjects made more correct decisions and took more time for decision making. So here we have now the, their fluid intelligence and the smarter subjects had a higher, the models of the smarter subjects had a higher decision making performance and a higher decision making time um, when we coupled this circuit to the prefrontal cortex and po posterior parietal regions of the large scale brain network model. We also um, validated the robustness and generalizability of this EI tuning rule and found in 1000 re-simulations um, uh, exact reproduction of the infrared dynamics, also of this pattern with increasing uh, synchrony and decreasing amplitude was robustly reproduced and there exists a stable and meaningful relationship between synaptic activity and the predicted functional con connectivity. So in summary, we now have brain network models that can be fitted with empirical FC with really high correlation based on a biological habian like fitting algorithm. The dynamics of the fitted models relate to empirical features of the subjects, supporting inference of healthy and biological neurocommutational mechanisms. And by coupling these decision-making circuits with the brain network models, we can now simulate cognitive processes with the virtual brain before it was the resting state virtual brain. Now we have task TVB. And this multi-scale task TVB now explains the cognitive performance of the simulated human. With this, um, at my end, I'm thanking you for your attention and invite you to ask questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schirmer. And now, indeed, we have time for questions, and you still have the opportunity to post them in the Q&A section. Uh, we already received uh, some questions, and we will start um, with the first one. I show it to you. Will this recording be available afterwards to participants? Yes, it will be available on the YouTube channel of the Human Brain Project. And we will also show you the URL um, at the end of this webinar. Um, next question goes uh, to Leon. Um, I have a question for Leon. How do you calculate the association between query terms and brain regions and TV base? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. It's it's a, a modified version of the kullback leibler um, divergence. So maybe you know this as a statistical um, distance measure. Um, it's modified because some axioms are not true for that case of distribution. So basically, it compares the frequency of a term in the particular search to um, the overall expectable frequency in the whole scientific literature. So if something is already a common word in literature, then you need much more higher frequency in the search query to receive a high relevance score, as we name it, because it's a bit modified of this distance metric. OK, thank you very much. And the next question goes to Jill. Dear Jill, if I want to use your model, how would I start? Yes, thanks. Uh, good question. We posted uh, one uh, link already in the chat. That's the DOI of our model eBrain's knowledge graph. If you click there, then you find a link there just on the front page to the men to a manual. And that manual is actually a PDF hosted on GitHub where you find a step-by-step -step guide how you would uh, need to install the Docker image and all necessary software packages to run it locally and also how you can opt to run it on eBrain's. Uh, but if there are more questions, feel free to reach out to us via email. Yes, thank you very much, Jill. And I also would like to encourage everyone if there are follow up questions, uh, just use uh, the Q&A tool and then we can continue the discussion. Um, I would actually like to uh, post myself in between a question to Jill as well. What are um, the steps to further improve uh, the deep brain stimulation? What is required in terms of improving the realism of uh, the stimulation model. Yeah, so, so far we have validated in, indirectly with fMRI data, but fMRI data was mostly recorded on the basal ganglia regions, and there was just uh, one um, activity for the whole cortex that we related it to. So as the next step, uh, a very important step to us is the validation step. So we really need to compare now all the model outcomes on the different scales, to as much data as we can get our hands on, basically, DBS on and off. So um, how we would, would like to do it is to first fit the DBS off state, so resting state data, 
of Parkinson's disease patients in this case and make the model as close to that data as we can, but then also to switch on the DBS virtual and compare whether our response of the model is similar to the response in the empirical data. But we would need different, or we actually have already different scale data for that. So there, the new electrodes can record as well as stimulate. These are the new Medtronic Percept electrodes for DBS. And we have data from them. So we have a local field potential data for the subthalamic nucleus. And then also we have whole brain imaging of fMRI on and off with DBS. Thank you very much. Um, next question to Leon. Um, how does the PVP ontology help to develop cause and effect models? Yeah, thank you. So, so the TV ontology, I have not uh, had much time to, to describe it. So maybe I just shortly give a short explanation. It's an ontology, so it, it's also a graph-like structure, but it also contains uh, the rules of how the nodes of a graph are, can be connected. And these nodes are actually the, the parameters and other structures of uh, the simulation. So for example, all the model parameters of all the many different neural mass models, but also the global um, global integration parameters as a global coupling, a scaling factor or something like this are all integrated there and they are described what they mean. And um, there we have two connections included. First, the, the, correlate, the, the relation to, to other parameters. So for example, to which parameters of other models there are, they, they can be compared to, but also the connection to biological surrogates. And this is then the point where it can help to develop new mechanistic models, because with, um, when we compare the, the virtual brain, on, brain ontology to biological concepts, like, for example, mesh terms or Go concepts, uh, these are concepts that are also included in other knowledge graphs and knowledge bases, as those that I've shown you, for example, neuro -MM -SIG and so on. And therefore, we can identify pathways and, uh, for example, for Alzheimer's disease and will directly uh, be able to link it to particular parameters of the virtual brain. So, of course, in the end, you have, as a researcher, designed the model in the end uh, on your own and informed by your own brain, but uh, the TVO can, can recommend models and will therefore make also the, the um, process of identifying a mechanism much more transparent and I think also more um, better just in all aspects. Thank you very much. I think the next question also goes to Leon. Can we screen high risk individuals pre MCI even before the MCI symptoms set in using fluid biomarkers plus EG plus volumetric MRI, fMRI using AI modeling? Um, I would say yes, um, but we haven't done it yet. We are currently working on that. So we have we are working on a follow up. Of, um, of this uh, study, which was a proof of principle with a, with a small cohort. And we are extending it with a cohort with more than 1,000 subjects from the Alzheimer's disease uh, neuroimaging initiative. And there, we also take into account other biomarkers, as for example, CSF fluid biomarkers and so on. Um, so I would definitely hope that this is possible. And especially as, as you correctly said in the question or, or, or suggested, the most interesting part is, of course, to, to find the converters to, to those those um, healthy controls or very subjective cognitive uh, impairment uh, patients, for example, uh, to identify, identify which of them will develop Alzheimer's disease in a later stage. And this data is also available and we are working on this, but it's not done yet. So not with TVB, but with other, but just with empirical data, of course, other people are working on that. Thank you very much. Now, a question for Michel. Um, how would you apply this approach to Alzheimer's? Yes, so basically what we now have in the brain network model is um, a first understanding how um, cognition and decision making and assuming working memory states uh, looks like in the brain um, and so having a mechanistic understanding, right? So with, with AI models, we only have a black box and we don't really understand um, what is happening. So with a brain network model, we really try um, to model the biophysics that underlie the observed signals. And now we can relate this to actual cognitive function. So before that, we only have um, neural activity like um, firing rates that oscillate, synaptic activity that oscillates and so on. And now there's really a mechanism in the model that can integrate incoming sensory input 
and um, compute uh, an output out of this. And we can then estimate a behavioral performance from that um, by, by looking how good the decision was made, how good um, it was able to integrate the inputs. So as a next, next step then, um, we would use this fitting algorithm to fit the data to um, Alzheimer's data, um, like data that Dr. Stefanowski mentioned, um, where there are huge data sets available, for example, the UK Biobank and so on, where we also have um, prospective Alzheimer converters. And um, there we can then fit the, the model to these data and infer um, how the mechanisms in these models would then change compared to the healthy models and try to infer a mechanistic explanation basically how cognition changed in these models. Thank you very much. Next question for Dr. Mona Meyer. Is there anything similar to the DBS models you showed for transcranial magnetic stimulation? Yeah, it's probably me. <laughs> um, yes. Please call me Joe. Um, yeah, there it's is actually. Like this, Dr. Yeah, 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 you're, you're right. <laughs> um, yes, there is. So uh, there is just an out a preprint uh, from Davide Momi and from John Griffith's lab that they, where they quite accurately fit uh, TMS evoke potentials with uh, the Janssen RIT model. And the Janssen RIT model is also already implemented for a long time and Leon showed you results of that inside the virtual brain. So they did not use the virtual brain, but we already have made a setup where we use the virtual brain and we used virtual transcranial magnetic stimulation to try to also reproduce the TMS evoked potentials of first healthy controls. So yes, there is, it's not published yet that we're working on it. Thank you. Next question uh, to Leon Stefanowski. How exactly can you make use of receptor density data from eBrains? Yeah, so it's also it's also a more um, future approach, but we are also already working on this. So it's also work in progress. There are, I, I think, two very powerful possibilities uh, of data that is available on eBrains. One is um, receptor autoradiography. So just, um, yeah. Um, Imaging advanced imaging methods uh, also of, of brain tissue where you can um, get the, the density of uh, several receptors. So also several receptor types for the same transmitter, for example, D1 and D2 and so on. And the other possibility is even broader, which is gene expression data, because uh, you know, for of course, for all the receptors, the, um, the genes, and um, then you can just have a look where in the brain this gene is expressed more and um, or, or less. And uh, this can be used to um, to uh, in, uh, in, apply it as a, as a additional layer to these uh, drug models, for example. So for example, I've shown you the works of Memantine as an NMDA antagonist, but there in the absence of such a map, we just applied it homogeneously to the whole brain. But of course, the effect is much stronger in those areas that have more NMDA receptors. And we are currently also working on um, implementing the NMDA receptor density into a model. And the same can also be useful for receptors in particular that are uh, targets of other drugs. So mainly I would think of um, dopamine receptors or serotonin receptors. And there is also um, similar work also done by um, Morten Kringelbach and uh, Gustavo Deco with uh, PET for serotonin PET. And this can be then um, also translated um, without this expensive PET technique, maybe in the future using data from eBrains. Thank you very much. And we have time for the three final questions. Uh, number one, to Misha Shona, Dr. Shona, would it be possible to use MEG EG to further inform the functional model? Thanks. This is an exciting question, really. Um, so this, this is a really exciting um, approach I would like to test. Um, and this goes very much in the direction what Dr. Ritter presented in her initial presentation, um, where she showed the results where we used EEG data to drive the brain network models. And um, Basically, this is, yeah, I, I, I love this idea, basically. So what we are still using in the cognition models um, that I presented is uh, noise to drive the model. Um, so this is drawn just from a normal distribution and then used to drive the model. But 
um, of course, the EEG data or MEG data contains much more information. And um, by combining this earlier approach with this newer approach now, I think um, one, yeah, this would even more help to basically infer mechanisms. So uh, great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next question for Dr. Jill. Can your DBS simulation model be used for any disease like OCD or depression? Yes, quite easily. So uh, the model that we set up is uh, a proof of pins principle that uh, you can do virtual DBS with the virtual brain. Um, if you want to use it for OCD or depression, you might want to have different targets for the DBS stimulus as there are different targets uh, for these diseases actually. And then you might want to have a slightly different multi-scale model. So that depends then only on the part that you want to model in detail, the part surrounding the electrode. So if that's uh, for depression, another target, you want to have the spiking activity of that target and the surrounding regions of that target. So what you would have to do is to find a spiking model um, either to find a spiking model and um, connect it with the virtual brain for these diseases and these circuits, a nest model you could connect, a neuron model we can now connect with the virtual brain, anything like that. Or you maybe want to opt to not use multi-scale and go uh, just for the mean field view of the DBS effect, which is also, of course, fine. Then uh, you can use the model directly and just uh, leave out the spiking activity of the basal ganglia, which will give you um, a brain network model. Um, where you can stimulate any region and you can fit to any other empirical data of patients also suffering from different diseases. Thank you very much. And now comes uh, the final question um, for Dr. Stefanowski. It looks like the combination of machine learning and TVP brain simulation could be really interesting and powerful. I am wondering, have you tried to predict Alzheimer's disease in a longitudinal data set? to recognize AD patients before they show serious cognitive decline? Yeah, so, so I think it's, it's related to, the, to this other question that I answered, answered before. So we are doing this right now. It's not, it's not done yet, but we definitely plan to do this. And uh, maybe even on top, what, um, be, what I would think would be the gold standard in the longitudinal data set is really to use pathological data then um, in the end. So, so of course, this is uh, rare data because uh, you need long uh, long time to <clears throat> to observe a population but um, this would be i think the ideal case to predict alzheimer's disease in a preclinical cohort already and then based or trained on the uh, neuropathological diagnosis thank you very much and uh, thanks again to all the speakers for the presentations and for the discussion and uh, thank you to the audience for attending this webinar if you're interested uh, to replay um, the video recording, then just uh, go to the Human Brain Project YouTube channel There you will find uh, this webinar. And also, if you have more questions and we were not able to, to cover your questions, you can contact uh, us at outreach at humanbrainproject.eu. Um, also, we would like to make the announcement for the next webinar, which will take place on October 20th about schizophrenia a temporal disorder. So thank you for your participation and I wish you all a good remaining day. Bye-bye.